Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. On behalf of CAR, I would like to call this meeting to order. Welcome you to May General Membership Meeting. To begin today's meeting, I welcome you to stand and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, in liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, I would like to, for us all to acknowledge a car antitrust statement. This statement ensures that we are encouraging discussions that promote all realtors and, uh, and we do not restrict competition among members or potential members. We work to foster a forum for an open discussion of diverse opinions without attempting in any way to discourage or sanction any business practice. A car antitrust statement will be acknowledged before every car meeting. The full copy of the antitrust statement is available at registration desk for in-person attendees, and it will be included in the handouts for Zoom participants. Now we're gonna move on to the approval of the minutes from our March general membership meeting. The minutes were included in this morning's handouts. Are there any additions or corrections to the distributed minutes? If so, please raise your hand or submit your feedback using the Zoom chat window. I don't see any. <laughs> if not, they stand approved as distributed. Thank you. We are extremely grateful to our diversity, equity, and inclusion pre uh, presenting sponsor, Virginia Housing, for stepping up and helping us provide this great program. At this time, I would like to invite Adrian Whitaker, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion of Virginia Housing to share a few words. Yay, come on up. Good morning. I think this is my third time coming down to visit with you all. I love it. I love it. You know, in fact, today is my first day at work this week. Yep. Um, I had, I wasn't feeling quite well on Monday. And I said, I need to go home. I need to climb in bed. I need to drink lots of tea, orange juice, so I can be ready to go to Charlottesville on Thursday. And it worked. So, um, but I am the DEI director at Virginia Housing. And at Virginia Housing, we refer to diverse DEI as IDEA. And I like to coin it our bright idea because it really is a tool that we use. So IDEA stands for inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And when I say that it's a tool, it's the tool that we use to ensure that we attract and retain a diverse, talented associate base. It's also the tool that we use as we do business with our business partners who share our vision and as we go out into the communities to serve our mission, which is to ensure that all Virginians have affordable housing. And the emphasis is on all. Through our programs, such as our down payment assistance programs, through our various program pro our programmatic areas, uh, Virginia housing is about inclusivity. So we are happy to be with you again this month again, and I'll come back again and again and again. Um, this time I don't have my sidekick, Frank, but next time I'll have them. But we're happy to be a sponsor and we're happy to partner with you all today. Thank you.
Thank you, Adrian, for those um, nice words. We value the professionalism, service, and support of our affiliates at CAR and its members, and full transparency. Um, Adrian, I'm not sure if you realize, but I have been appointed to the Virginia Housing Home Ownership Advisory Council. First meeting next week. See you next week, exactly. So if you're joining us on Zoom, please review the handouts to learn more about the Virginia housing. For those of you in the room, please be sure to visit the table outside for additional information. To build a diverse, equitable, and inclusive association that equips members to grow as ethical and responsible professionals, CAR is committed to bringing influential speakers to broaden our mindset and change the way we think and approach issues so that we will be better for our clients and other associates. Throughout the efforts of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, it's now a committee, no longer a council, we are thrilled to have Joe Jamison, CEO and founder of Visit Able LLC and Corey Parody as he told me the correct way to pronounce his name. It looks a little bit different, but it's pronounced parody. Chief Operating Officer of Visit Able LLC with us this morning. If you would like to learn more about Joe or Corey, please refer to, the, to today's handouts. If you have a question for Joe or Corey, please wait until the end of the presentation and we will allow you to come to the mic and answer, ask any questions, okay? And if you're at Zoom, use the uh, Zoom Q&A feature toolbar for your questions. Joe and Corey, I hand the meeting over to you. Come on up. You give them a hand. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for coming out today. And thank you for tuning in to listen a little bit more to disability inclusion and awareness, um, an introduction to the training that we will be putting on um, for uh, CAR members and associates. Really excited to be here today. First, just wanted to uh, share a little bit more about us and who we are and put a face behind a name and give you some uh, context of our mission and vision. Um, our company is called Visitable, and Visitable is a disability inclusion and awareness firm as opposed to a compliance firm. A lot of times people think of disability in the lens of compliance, whether that be FHA or ADA, um, but we're really focused on enabling better experiences for people of all abilities, no matter what scenario, to live, to work, to play. Um, you could be a customer, a client, an employee, just really creating better experiences across the board. Uh, my name is Joe Jamison. I'm the founder of Visible. And my background is that my father has used a wheelchair my entire life. And I just noticed how he was treated differently than the rest of my family. There were times where we would go to different locations and employees would speak to me the whole time and not acknowledge his presence at all. There were times where inappropriate questions or intrusive questions were asked unintentionally that would you know, kind of feel uncomfortable. And there were also times where conversations were solely had around my father's disability when it really wasn't relevant to the uh, conversation at hand or the, the task at hand and wasn't really wanted at all. So this, these kind of experiences leave a bad taste in your mouth. It really makes you um, not wanna come back to a place or not engage with that person again or not share a positive experience. So what we're really trying to do at Visible is change the attitudes um, in today's society uh, in order to change mindsets, um, to change positive change behaviors, and therefore change culture um, to make sure that people with disabilities are served and accommodated um, and treated respectfully and kindly. Um, so while my personal passion started with my father's background who was, uh, had a mobility disability we went out and started, we realized the importance of accessibility for everyone of all types of abilities. Uh, we conducted you know, primary and secondary research via surveys, focus groups, um, and a bunch of secondary research as well, and went out and earned the Certified Professional and Accessibility Core Competency Certificate um, to really um, boost our credibility, to boost our knowledge, to create, uh, become really the subject matter expert um, in terms of verbiage, interaction, things that compliance doesn't cover, 
um, to really improve the experience for people with all abilities. And next I'll let Corey share a little bit about his background and his passion as well. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> um, good to be here this morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Corey Parity. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Visitable. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I've been a wheelchair user my entire life. I have a disability uh, that requires me to use a wheelchair. I, uh, my background is in the built environment primarily, um, but since joining Visible, I was really inspired by the mission of changing attitudes and culture around disability inclusion and awareness. And that is really the first step to kind of creating a more inclusive environment overall is changing kind of culture and how people view disability inclusion. Um, I also have a certification as a certified ADA coordinator. Um, so I have that you know, professional expertise as well, as well as my personal passion. Um, have personal experience as well in housing a little bit just from the from the uh, client side. I live by myself in an apartment, so um, know a little bit about the challenges and kind of um, opportunities in the real estate um, field from, from the user uh, experience side. So thank you all for being here. So um, what are we really doing here today, right? When we talk about inclusion and awareness um, for people with disabilities, um, I like to ask, to ask this question when I do in-person presentations. Who here knows somebody with a disability or has some form of disability themselves? Right. Um, yeah, it's a majority of people in the room and I'm sure the people on Zoom as well um, know somebody with a disability. Um, a lot of times, you know, we think of disability as, oh, it's only a small, you know, portion of the population, right? But uh, statistics show that about one in four people have some form of disability. So it's a pretty significant uh, chunk of the population. Um, about 85% of people with disabilities are not satisfied with both um, kind of just the general legislation that's in place now. Um, there's kind of a a gap between compliance and what's actually inclusive. Um, from the financial perspective, um, people with disabilities have about $21 billion in discretionary income. Uh, that's just to kind of illustrate, you know, people with disabilities do have purchasing power, are looking to buy houses, are looking to, you know, speaking from my personal experience, you know, I would love to have a home someday. Um, and people do have the ability to to purchase homes and to live independently. So um, yeah, where we, where we really um, kind of step in is trying to go above and beyond uh, just minimum compliance to really interact with people on a more proactive personal level um, to just kind of bridge that gap between what's actually accessible and inclusive and what the FHA or ADA might have to say about accessibility. Um, Great. And when we talk about these numbers and we talk about uh, just the sheer size of the disabled population and the spending power, it's important to note that this importance and relevance of disability inclusion is not going away anytime soon. It's only going to increase. Um, the fact that the uh, 65 uh, plus population in America is increasing over the next decades um, only means because 40 percent of, of that population has at least one disability that the disabled population is going to be growing in the coming decades. Not only that, but of course, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a huge emphasis in, in the United States right now. Um, and unfortunately, disability isn't always included in those efforts. Uh, we found a statistic online that while 90% of companies have DEI plans, only 4% of those companies incorporate disability into those DEI plans. So we're really trying to help bridge this gap and this opportunity that we see to uh, really take a holistic approach and look at DEI. So I just wanted to share some inclusion tips kind of with you all on a general level um, when it comes to personal interaction with clients, uh, fellow employees, uh, anybody that you might come into contact with um, in your professional or personal life. Uh, first one, um, I, this has happened to me a lot and people we've spoken with as well in our research. Uh, people try to be helpful, right? They want to be helpful. It's kind of a natural kind of instinct. 
for some people. Um, so for example, I'll be going up a hill uh, or a steep incline like I was this, this morning, trying to get into the front door. Um, and I was kind of struggling a little bit. Um, when, when you're in a situation like that and you see somebody that might need help, um, you know, uh, don't touch her, you know, try to help the person um, without uh, getting permission first. So that, that's the big uh, kind of first step there. Along with that, um, kind of hand in hand, make sure you ask the person if they want help before just, you know, assisting them uh, with whatever they might need help with. Um, number three, do not call a person brave or an inspiration just because they have a disability. This happens pretty frequently in our culture. Um, you know, I come up to people and, and they'll say, wow, you know, you're such an inspiration for, for, you know, being here today or for doing what you do. And it's like, you know, it's just my life, right? Um, so uh, just, just because somebody has a disability doesn't necessarily make them kind of an inspiration. Um, and this also happens a lot kind of in propaganda, like motivational speaking, uh, things like that. Like they'll have a poster of somebody uh, that might be a professional swimmer that doesn't have a leg, right? And they'll say, you know, if they can do it, what's your excuse kind of thing. Um, so yeah, um, people like to be judged on their abilities and their merits, not just because, you know, they have a disability. So um, number four, addressing the person with a disability uh, first, if they're the ones communicating with you. Um, a lot of times individuals might be uncomfortable or not know how to have uh, conversations with people with disabilities, just kind of across the board. Um, again, uh, like for example, I'll be out with a friend or colleague uh, going to a restaurant or, or interacting with somebody on any level. And I noticed that even though I'm engaged in kind of listening to the conversation and participating, uh, they won't kind of engage me directly. Um, so making sure that you're engaging everybody in the conversation uh, equally and not just talking to the person that may not have a disability just because, you know, you might be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, uncomfortability is kind of part of this conversation, right? As a, as a society, you know, uh, we have to be a little, we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable sometimes. So making sure that you engage everybody equally um, in whatever interactions you're having is a huge uh, kind of step as well towards inclusion. Great, number five, avoid talking or asking about a person's disability unless it is relevant to the task at hand. So this is one of the examples I gave when I first introduced myself and my father and I's experience. A lot of times people would come in and ask, um, you know, how did you drive here? Um, you know, when did you get your disability? Um, can you, you know, I actually have a broken leg. I had a broken leg the other day. I know exactly how you feel. And they try to like, uh, just try to like relate to them. And it's, I, I guess it's well-intentioned, but it, you know, it kind of comes off as almost like objectifying or, you know, looking at someone only for their disability when they're much more than that. While a disability is an important part of a person to recognize and acknowledge, um, it's not solely who they are. They uh, enjoy every single type of, you know, conversational topics that other people enjoy, um, such as, you know, sports or weather or whatever the case is. Um, do not speak to a person with a disability with a different tone, volume, or style. The person will ask you to speak louder if necessary. So. This is, uh, I think, there's an underlying assumption thing here that we could probably bring up is, you know, for example, you may speak to someone um, that uh, has a speech disability that may not speak the same as you and I, and you may assume that they're deaf and you just start speaking as loud as you can um, <laughs> to make sure you hear them. But in reality, you know, you don't, you don't know that, right? Um, you wanna speak to them as you would anybody else and they can let you know most likely if they want you to speak louder. Another example is when someone who is deaf, you assume that, hey, uh, you know, they're gonna lip read um, and they're, that's how they communicate with me. So they'll over enunciate and just like, like no one can read your lips <laughs> when you do that. So that's just another example, like speak how you wanna be, uh, speak like you would anybody else. Uh, I guess another one is even like those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, when you, sometimes when people speak to uh, that population, um, they may uh, speak in a condescending or a patronizing manner or um, like in a baby kind of manner, uh, tone, uh, treat someone, you know, like they're supposed to be treated like their age and they will let you know 
if they need to be treated differently. I will say that you want to make sure you have enough time to um, digest information and respond when you're, you're uh, interacting with that population. But um, the takeaway here is that you want to be able to speak to everyone um, like you would anybody else, and they will let you know how to uh, speak differently if needed. Number seven, when helping clients online via phone call or in person, ask about accommodations. So this is a huge one. I think this is a, a, a big pro tip that can really elevate um, your business with clients um, and how you're interpreted and how inclusive you are. This is a great way to be proactive and positive. This is a good way to, uh, you know, some examples could be, um, you could also ask for specific accommodations, but some examples you may see is, do you want to see this listing or property virtually instead of in person? Um, having flexibility in your form, signing online versus in person, um, having you know someone that's a designated uh, signer for someone, being able to sign a form for them, um, there's, and having different flexibility in, and where to meet or how to communicate. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you wanna be flexible and this is a great way to be proactive uh, and be able to know what to expect as well. Number eight. Um, this is speaking a little bit to the awkwardness of the conversation sometimes. Uh, we, you know, we try to be helpful and um, respectful of people and sometimes conversations can be awkward uh, around people with disabilities. It just happens. Um, uh, so this one is really some, like getting to, okay, what happens if I offend somebody unintentionally and didn't mean to? Um, if the person was offended um, and they, you know, they kind of make, make known that they're offended, um, just as you would with anything else, you know, apologize, uh, make sure, you know, that you don't say that uh, wording that you just said or that you don't do the action that you just, um, that you just did. And then kind of use it as a learning experience and ask the person if there's a better way that they could have handled a situation or a topic. Um, having said that, you know, like I said, uh, people are people, we're all gonna make mistakes, nobody's perfect. So just try and, you know, handle that situation as best you can. Um, people are understanding on the other side of that conversation too. So um, number nine, greet everybody proactively and offer help in a general way. So when you're meeting a client, whether they have a disability or not, you know, uh, more, you know good morning, how you doing? Um, here to show you this property or here to interact with you and whatever kind of interaction you may be having. Is there anything I can help you with or anything I can do to, uh, to make this process easier or more accommodating. Um, just proactively offering that as a business, kind of general business practice is a good way to, way to go just across the board uh, because you'll be helping those with disabilities and those without disabilities um, kind of in the same manner. Uh, number 10, um, this is a big one I think for open houses. Uh, make sure that the, the environment um, that you do walkthroughs of the house uh, before you might be showing it to a potential client or do walkthroughs of the office if somebody's coming into the office to make sure that there's no kind of barriers, uh, chairs in the way, things like that that might prevent um, accessibility or, or you know, present an obstacle to accessibility. Just proactively making sure that pathways are clear, things like that um, is kind of a general practice to do uh, both in the open house setting and um, just when you're interacting with clients in general um, in the built environment. Leading into that, we have a bit of an exercise that I will let Joe just discuss. Great. So when we say take walkthroughs proactively, uh, we could spend another day uh, talking about everything that you could look for and how you could uh, fix that. But we just came up with two quick examples today a little interactivity hoping to get with the audience and maybe even online if we can have some help. Um, but we are, uh, we wanted to share some situations of barriers and just easy ways that you can fix barriers. And just as to get the mind thinking, you don't have to like buy a new table or buy new chairs all the time to make things accessible. There's, there's simple stuff you could do. And that's what we're hoping to uh, really portray with these examples. So I will read and I'll do this in an accessible manner. I'm going to describe what's in this picture um, and then I'm going to ask you all, why is it a barrier and how it can be fixed? So in this picture, there is a table on the right. There's a radiator on the left. There are chairs spread throughout the room. Um, this is a conference room, but could be, you know, just like a dining room or a coffee shop or anywhere else that you might meet a client. So I'll just ask, why is this situation a barrier? What are the barriers within this picture? 
right, right, very easy, this easy one. <laughs> How can it be fixed? Push them in, right. So this is part of doing walkthroughs, right? Um, every time you use a table or um, there's an open house, taking walkthroughs proactively before and after the use of that table and or space um, to make sure that the chairs are uh, pushed in and people have a pathway to get by. The magic number we like to share is 36 inches. That's three feet. Um, you can step three times if you have men's size 12 shoes um, or carry around a yardstick in your trunk, whatever you want to do. Um, so that was the big one I want to take away from this picture. That is the easy fix. Um, in case you're curious, the other barriers that could be pointed out in this picture is a radiator that could be hot, that someone that's blind or low vision could walk into, having some type of railing or barrier around it so people can't walk into it. Um, the fact that the chairs only have wheels on them means that it's gonna be difficult for someone to transfer if they need a staple um, thing to hold on to in order to change from chair to chair surface. Um, so that may require you know, purchasing a different type of chair or purchasing a rail and installing it. But the easy thing I was trying to portray with this was that you can just push chairs in and you'll make a, a pathway more accessible for those with mobility devices. So here's another example. Um, we have a picture of a hallway and with a cabinet door that's uh, kind of open into the hallway. The hallway is a little bit narrow um, and there's uh, kind of doorways on either side of the hallway, on either end of the hallway. Um, and the bottom of the cabinet is probably about 30 or so inches off the floor. Um, so why is this barrier um, and how can it be addressed or how can it be fixed? Right. Um, yeah, simple things here as you're going around spaces, right, to make sure that you're paying attention to. Um, so the, the key kind of concept here is what we call a protruding object, um, which is anything that protrudes more than four inches off the wall between 27 and 80 inches above the floor. Um, a lot of times we see this with fire extinguishers, AED cabinets, uh, you know, different things in the home that might be sticking off the wall uh, more than four inches. Um, so in this case, the easy fix here, like you all said, is just closing the cabinet door, making sure that's not a protruding object um, because people that are blind, uh, the reason it's 27 to 80 inches above the floor is somebody with a, with a cane that's blind or low vision um, can detect uh, things typically that are below 27 inches above the floor. Anything above that is not really uh, what they call cane detectable. So that's where the 27 inch number comes from. Um, so just making sure things aren't sticking out into kind of the circulation path, the path of travel is the big one here. And just closing the cabinets uh, can fix that. Also wanted to point out here that the knob to open the cabinet um, is a bit high. Um, so that's also a potential barrier as well. Um, that, that speaks a little bit more to reach range, um, that you want to have kind of objects in general, uh, whether it's a cabinet door, whether it's, you know, stuff, you know, cabinets above countertops, things like that. Um, the, the reach range you kind of want to shoot for is 48 inches. Um, anything above that is kind of inaccessible. So, um, you know, as you're looking through inventory of houses, things like that, um, just some kind of things you can keep in mind to help find more accommodating and accessible uh, living environments for clients. Yeah, just a couple things to add there. Um, the two easy solutions I think that we touched on, or one that we touched on was just closing the cabinets, making sure those are closed in your walkthroughs. Um, another idea that we sometimes share is if there like, is an AED cabinet, uh, but for example, you could put a, a trash can underneath, so that will be cane detectable. So people are going to detect the trash can before they run into the AED cabinet um, is another example there. And in terms of the re reach ranges, that's a good point. We see that a lot with unreachable, um, you know, washer and dryer stacked on top of each other, um, microwaves being above the cabinets. Um, there, there are adaptive housing and accessible housing measures out there that fix all those items, but that is something that we often see as well. Great. So we shared, a, we feel like that went by very fast. Uh, we shared a couple of examples. We shared some of the interaction best practices and uh, two examples, I guess, of the 
the built environment and making uh, more accessibility there. These are just a couple of examples though. Um, fortunately, we have partnered with CAR to bring you all um, the opportunity to a more comprehensive education where we will be talking more about verbiage and, and words and phrases to avoid and uh, more interaction best practices, more real estate industry specific best practices, um, the ideal accessible housing best practices, a lot more comprehensive education that we're really extremely passionate about. And we want you all to attend. Uh, we will have, um, go to that in a second, but we want you guys to participate. I just wanted to share that we are gonna be bringing more to you all. Yeah, so this is a little bit of kind of the course outline here. Um, we talk about, you know, what is disability inclusion? We talked about some of that today. Um, do's and don'ts of disability inclusion, uh, important terms and concepts, assumptions, best practices, words and phrases to avoid, things like that. Uh, the third section there, FHA uh, reminders and kind of accessible housing features. Um, that's where we get into the more real estate specific practices um, to help, you know, help clients find more accessible housing and accessible homes. I will say here personally, um, like for me, like I touched on earlier, right? Um, the American dream is to own a home, right? That's, that's kind of the quintessential American dream in my experience so far, just trying to find my own housing has been the only accessible options I've found have been um, kind of apartment buildings, condos, things like that, things that are newer, right? So unless you have, you know, $400,000 or whatever to build your own home, <laughs> there's really kind of limited inventory. Um, so the inventory that is out there, it's important to know kind of what will work for clients, even if it's not, you know, specifically designed for them, there are certain features that can make homes more accessible than others. And it's important to kind of know what those are. So we go into that a little bit more in our full training. And then, um, yeah, then there's there's quizzes and interactive exercises as well as part of that training. Uh, but yeah, that's just kind of a brief overview of our outline. Yeah, one and, important thing to note here is that we applied for accreditation from Virginia DPOR for this course. So this is an opportunity for you all to receive one hour of real estate related CE credit and the details of how to sign up for this course and when it's actually gonna be taking place. Uh, we have two options to be able to participate um, in this full comprehensive education that we are offering. One is an in-person session on June 1st, two weeks from now at 10 a.m. here, gonna be free, I believe sponsored by Virginia Housing. Um, and an online self-guided module um, is another option that is kind of our bread and butter. We are um, this online self-guided company, but we love giving in-person sessions as well. So we'd love for you guys to tune in either way. Uh, we are still uh, finalizing some details on that online self-guided version. Um, so we will um, get back to you soon via uh, Teresa or Allie. And that's all we have for our presentation today. Thank you for listening. We'd love to take any questions if you guys have any. So um, are you all working with the Home Builders Association and talking with them about the importance of 36 inch doors and really making sure not only the primary doors, but you know, great, you can get in the bedroom, but you can't get in the closet or the bathroom. The, I'll, I'll answer real quick and let Corey take over. Uh, the answer is no, we're not. We're really kind of new into this real estate space and kind of like the uh, building um, ownership, that kind of thing. We're really interested in being connected to all the players in the space and all the ones that have an impact in accessibility. Um, we would welcome any introductions. We have a um, an email up there that, and we can pass our business cards as well. Um, really excited to learn more and be connected with more players in the industry. Um, but the answer currently is no. Yeah, just to add to that, I wanted to say, um, you know, kind of the point of our training is we do realize that, you know, some houses aren't going to be built accessibly or, you know, the doorways might be too narrow. Um, I think part of the takeaway, hopefully for you all, is by sharing kind of some of those features, uh, you can more easily kind of identify 
uh, things like that that may work for clients um, in spaces that are already built. But you bring up a, an excellent point there um, that there's this kind of a culture mindset shift that needs to happen as well with building in general. Um, you know, like I, like I touched on earlier, uh, inventory that's accessible, you know, never mind just inventory in general, but accessible inventory is extremely limited. So just being able to, to kind of see uh, what may or may not work for clients with disabilities and to kind of be fam more familiar with those features um, is kind of a, hopefully a big takeaway from our, from our training. Yeah, and not only that, but like the interaction piece, right? It doesn't always have to be about the built, built environment, even though that's a passion and extremely important. Um, it's also about what everyone can do, both on the clock and off, to be more accessible and how they communicate, how they interact, how they treat and accommodate and serve. Um, our MLS committee might uh, um, not be happy with me for this question, but we, when we do a listing, we have a number of boxes we can check as far as disability access. I would be uh, interested to know uh, what your thoughts would be after having a chance to look at that list. So just sure. a suggestion. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Um, I, I was actually gonna say part of the same thing, which is that my, my brother-in-law is in a wheelchair um, and he lives in, uh, he has been for 20 some years and he lives in California, but it took him about five years to find a home that was a single family home that he could modify to be accommodating to him. Um, so it, I do think it's very important. And I think, you know, you all probably aren't aware of this, but as realtors we are, NAR came up with a green designation in the past couple of years, right? To help realtors understand what's green about a house and how do we market those to people. So in the MLS, we have a bunch of check boxes. We have a whole section on accessibility, just like Tom said. So maybe for you guys to focus one of your, you know, um, trainings on teaching people what those are. Cause I know when I look at it, I don't understand all of them. Um, personally. So I would love to, you know, be trained on how do we make sure we're checking all the right boxes so that people who need an accessible home are able to find it easily on the internet. Because I think there's probably properties out there that have accessibility features that aren't being marketed properly because we're not properly trained in how to understand that. So that's a, a whole, you know, um, thing that we could do. Another thing that I noticed, he just visited us not too long ago. And um, I was trying to figure out what restaurant in Charlottesville we were going to go to dinner at. And like, there's so many lovely restaurants in Charlottesville, but I was having to rack my brain about like, where can we easily get into, you know, and I wasn't able to find the information on any of the websites. And so that would be another just simple thing that companies could do would be to say, on their website, like near where they have their hours or their reservation or something like if they have an excessive, like if they have a um, barrier to state that, um, you guys will know, like I kind of wanted to take him to alley light, but like I couldn't remember in my brain if like I would be able to get him into alley light, you know, like, um, and so that was just part of something that came up for us as a family. Um, and then um, the other, the last thing I was gonna say is you could do an adaptive housing designation like the green designation where people are more trained and actually have some type of certification as a realtor to either provide that or not provide that. The last thing was, does CAR have access to um, someone who knows American Sign Language? If any of us were to have a client who was deaf, how would we service them? How, do we have resources for that? We could check our database. We track um, just second languages or third languages for the realtors if it's acknowledged on their membership application or we learn about it when they come to visit. I don't know if we have something for sign language, but we could certainly take a look at what we have now. And then we could ask the existing membership if they do it, or we could also look for local resources. We have some resources on our training as well. Some links that you can bookmark and things like that. Perfect. Yeah. Laurie, you had a question? Thank you, good morning. Um, it's very timely, I think, that you mention 
uh, about don't call a person brave or uh, an inspiration just because they have a disability. I was just in a conversation with a veteran who said that he didn't, and he feels that other veterans don't appreciate um, being told thank you for your service because some of them are not really pleased or you know about the things that they endured in during the service. I was very surprised about that and asked them, you know, well, what would you rather have us say? And that is uh, something that when you mentioned that uh, and you address that in number eight uh, about asking what it is you'd rather have somebody say, is there something you can tell us? Because if I said something and I could very well could say that you're an inspiration or, um, you know, brave because of everything, everything you do, multiple things every single day that I couldn't, I don't foresee that I could handle as graciously as you do. What is a better term to use? Uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think that's going to vary from person to person and situation to situation. Um, I think just acknowledging the person kind of in the, and, you know, unless it's brought up in conversation or unless, you know, it kind of comes up, um, just kind of, you know, I don't like it's it's hard to know without context exactly, but like unless it's part of the conversation, or you know unless the conversation naturally goes there, um, I would just say avoid kind of those you know more uh, difficult things unless unless you're genuinely curious, right? And then I've had people come up to me and say, you know, don't want to be offensive here, not trying to be rude, but I'm just really curious, like you know, um, can you tell me more about this or or, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about your experience in this situation or that situation? Um, you know, coming from a place of genuine curiosity um, is kind of a better approach, I think. Um, having said that, though, there are people that will not want to talk about it, even if you are genuinely kind of curious about a situation. And, you know, most likely they'll tell you if you approach the conversation in that way, you, can, you know, I'd rather not talk about it, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's, I think that's probably the best advice I can give you there is if you really are curious, you know, approach it kind of that way to show that you're, you know, sincere and that you really do care about kind of the conversation and the questions or the conversation that you're having. So good question. Thank you so much. And one more comment I w wanted to make, um, to my realtor colleagues, I think, and, um, uh, mentioning comment back there too. If there's a public perception, um, negative or otherwise, when accommodations are, um, have accessibility to disabled people, I'm wondering um, how we could improve that as realtors in the MLS, um, you know, more information, adding pictures. Um, you know, I, I don't want this to be a negative because there are an awful lot of positive reasons that we should make note of everything. I know we have uh, some opportunity to mention what would help disabled people, but perhaps a form to include in the document section that uh, is, you know, has all the features in a home, um, just trying to get over um, possibly that public uh, perception of uh, you know, looking at it as a looking at a home that has is um, modified to great extent that someone without those disabilities may pass up whatever. So, uh, I think the first step is always. I don't know if this is related, but I think you're asking more or less to 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 re re say that right. You're saying what can we do to make sure the public um, acknowledges the accessibility of the houses that we, the properties that we are showing. Well, and for us to be positive about right. that. Yeah. I think um, the, I think the first step is really, in my opinion, is education, which you guys have already taken a substantial step on today. Um, we, if you are able to participate in our e-learning module at the very least, I know we have a certificate of completion there. And I believe that's just part of the VA DPOR process uh, with schools having certificates of completion, maybe broadcasting that like, hey, where, you know, we took an extra step to become educated on accessible housing features 
uh, disability inclusion, how to be respectful in communication, to show others like, hey, we know where you're coming from and we wanna help. I think that could be a great step to include with your materials as you market yourself to get new clients and to serve existing clients. Um, and then referencing, at least with that e-learning module, you can reference that year round, right? And be able to see, okay, these are the things that like I learned through the module. Um, and these are the things that I want to look out for and have in mind when I talk to a client. Um, you, can, you can broadcast that through just speaking if there's no official place on a, on a form. Um, and then we mentioned that idea of asking for accommodations proactively. I think as soon as someone sees that, like I think they're, at least when I see that on a form, I think, okay, they care. Like they are thinking ahead. They are trying to be accommodating. Um, and I think that that's another big thing as well. And that's a place for them to specify what they need help with. And you could always ask them like how to help specifically if you don't know or reference the training or, or whatever the case is. But I'll let Corey chime in too. Um, I was gonna say, just trying to better understand your question. Are you saying there's like a stigma around people that don't have disabilities that don't want to maybe look at a house that might have accessible features or, or I'm just I, trying to better understand that. I guess I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit. Sure. I am not proud to say that when given a choice between a hotel room that is accessible for people with disabilities versus one that's not, I would go with one that's, you know, doesn't have that a thought that came in mind is maybe our different businesses or in individual practices may have a um, category for, you know, ask us about accommodations or homes uh, for with disability access or something like that, have a specific place where people could um, go to also to find out about specific homes with proper uh, access. Yeah, I would, um, I would make sure that kind of all that kind of questions is in kind of your general interest in intake forms. And I will say too, um, an accessible home uh, works for everyone, right? Generally, um, accessible features are great for everyone across the board, not just people with disabilities. Um, it's a big part of kind of aging in place as well. That's a big plus. Uh, you know, you can say you can live in this home for the next 30, 40, 50 years uh, because it has, you know, lower countertops or a stove that has controls on the front of the stove, things like that. So um, accessible features are just a huge plus across the board for everyone, not just the disability community. I'm not sure if that kind of, but yeah, thank you. Yeah. Joe and Corey, we have one time for one more question and I believe it's coming from Zoom. We're gonna do two. Okay. Uh, frequent, <laughs> I, I wanna give the Zoom participants just as much time as those who are in person. So uh, frequently when we sell homes, owners have chair lifts, wheelchairs, electric chair, wheelchairs or other accessibility items that they no longer need. Where do we go to sell them or donate them these items? I have one that has a particularly new electric wheelchair now and not sure what to do with it. I just want to share one idea. Uh, we've met with some medical suppliers uh, around town and I'm forgetting the names of specific ones. Um, near the new smoked uh, restaurant in Charlottesville up 29, there's one behind that big building. Um, it's all blessings flow. Yes. All blessings flow. I've met Annie Dodd there. She's great. A uh, great person and human to know. And she would be willing to take uh, any medical supplies and that you could donate and or sell. And I'm not hundred percent sure about this, but the um, independence resource center on Cherry Avenue, I think downtown um, would also be a good resource to kind of, even if they don't take equipment, they would probably know, uh, know companies or, or businesses that would take equipment. So great question. Cherry Avenue is where the Charleston Independence uh, Resource Center. Independence Resource yeah. Center. Yeah, they're they're great there too. Thank you. Okay, last question. Also, I have recently been able to help sellers stay in their homes by installing elevators. Those are some new tubular elevators that are less expensive and fit in smaller areas now available. Is there any info on contractors or vendors who have experience in this? 
Uh, that's a great question. Um, I personally don't know of anybody um, like kind of contracting wise within the Charlottesville space, but I'm, you know, I'm curious if you all kind of would know people um, that do kind of contract tracking work. I think that's probably more uh, you all's expertise there. Um, yeah, I'm not and potentially again, that Charlottesville Independence Resource Center would know some of those. They have a lot of experience. They actually have an accessible housing like demonstration. It's really great um, at their location. You can go in and see like a microwave at an accessible height and what like an accessible kitchen would look like and accessible like laundry room and stuff like that too. Thank you all for your Thank time. You bring it down back to my short level again. <laughs> Joe and Corey, um, that was a great presentation, great information. Thank you so much. And those tips will be made available later via Allie, <laughs> whether she remembers or not. So as Joe previously stated, if you wish to continue this conversation and learn more about inclusive um, disability and awareness, we invite you to register for the dedicated class on Thursday, June the 1st from 10 to 11 a.m. here at the Hillsdale Conference Center. Registration is free and available on the CAR Education and Events calendar where you can register. This class does, as Joe stated before, um, include one hour of related continuing education, education credit. That's a bonus, plus all that great information. So thank you all again. So as realtors, we need to keep up and make sure that we have a pulse on what's happening within our market and around our footprint in the areas that we serve. We are fortunate to have with us today both uh, J.T. Newberry, Acting Director of Economic Principal, and Kevin McDormand, Acting Director of Planning, with us as to share an uh, to share an Albemarle County economic update. If you have any questions, as before, go to the mic, and if you're online, use the Q and A features. But remember to hold your questions until the end. All righty, J uh, JT and Kevin, I turn the meeting over to you. Is Kevin here? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Apologies that Kevin could not be here today. I do have a slide that he intended to present about a new tool that I think will be really beneficial to the uh, realtor community. So I'll just um, plug that now as a way to uh, whet your appetite for the end of the presentation. Um, the concept of an economic update uh, is a very broad topic. And um, over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm not gonna try to give an entire um, update on the local economy. I would like to just highlight some of the recent announcements about employers that are making really big investments in our community that I think are providing the kind of career ladder jobs that allow people to buy homes and raise families here. So I thought that was important for this audience to hear. And um, before I get started, I, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to Joe and Corey. Uh, that was an incredible presentation. I'm my mind is still spinning around all the different things we talked about. Um, so to, to dial into to this, just like Joe and Corey, I'm gonna try to start with the mission of economic development. And this is pretty standard across the country. Our mission is to grow the tax base. Our office in particular focuses on growing the non-residential non tax base. So commercial and industrial users um, the purpose of that is to try to shift the tax burden off of residential rooftops and um, uh, you know, distribute the, those costs 
across our local, um, our local population. Um, so the things that are different about the way Albemarle County does that though is um, we focus on primary businesses. So primary businesses are those, those that sell their good or service outside of our region and they therefore bring new money into our community. That's different than a business that we would call consumptive, something like a, a movie theater, or a coffee shop, a dry cleaner. Those are meant to serve the local community. So by focusing our efforts on those that are selling outside of the area, we're trying to bring more financial resources into our community. And um, I'd like to spend some time talking about just some, some recent announcements. So on uh, May the 4th, we had uh, the, the governor come, and I think I've set us on a, on a very fast track. Um, I can't quite talk this fast. Um, is there a way I can go back? Um, maybe I pressed it too many. Well, hey, um, we, 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 we can enjoy uh, the, the fast slideshow uh, just while I talk. Uh, on May the 4th, the governor uh, came to make an announcement about AgriSphere's. This is a company that produces a um, environmentally friendly herbicide and fungicide that has the potential to change agriculture around the world. Um, it's a company that came, that spurred out of the University of Virginia two under, uh, undergraduate students, uh, Payam and Amir, which we may see a picture of here in just a minute. Um, they uh, patented some technology that allowed the deployment of fungicides and pesticides to be much more efficient and to be shelf stable and relatively cheap. So they've attracted investment from um, some of the world's biggest investors in agriculture and um, they committed to $25 million of capital investment and creating 50, over 50 jobs um, at Seminole Place, 1180 Seminole Trail. So there's a, a many different businesses there. Um, they'll be constructing a, a, an expanded R&D facility and um, we, we can't wait to see where they go and what they do because they, they do have the potential to, to really change the world. Um, some of these pictures here show some of their, those existing facilities. Here are the founders with the, uh, with the governor. There was a, a touching moment where um, Payam, Payam's parents in particular um, came to America to give him the opportunity to be a doctor. Uh, and in the, in the middle of his uh, sort of presentation, he said, you know, sorry, mom and dad, I didn't become a doctor. I'm, you know, founding this company. And, um, it was just a really touching moment. Um, the next company is Bonomos, and some of you may already be familiar with them. They are occupying space in the, in the old state farm building on Pantops. They produce a rare, um, they produce a healthy sugar to replace um, the uh, impacts of how sugar and diabetes uh, have, have um, contributed to a number of diseases around the world. So they produce a, a something called tagatose and um, they have, they recently did a ribbon cutting on their uh, production facility. And if we go down uh, forward two slides, we can get to, this is the CEO and the governor with a huge sugar spoon of, of tagatose there. Um, and so uh, this is the CEO, Ed Rogers. He was recently on the national news talking about protecting their patent for this uh, product in China um, from, from um, intellectual property uh, concerns. And so 
they too have attracted international investment. Uh, their commitment was to 64 jobs and $27.7 million of capital investment in the state farm building. So that building is hundreds of thousands of square feet. They're not taking up the whole thing. Um, we're working to, to see if we can adaptively reuse the rest of that space. And so if we can go forward, this is a, that was a shot of their, um, their warehouse and, and some of the product that they've already produced and are getting ready to ship out. So that's just two, two examples of, of primary businesses that are creating the kinds of jobs that um, really lead to a, an affordable, um, you know, pay the kinds of wages that can allow someone to, to live here. I do wanna to touch on all the partners in our community who do a tremendous amount of work in this space as well. And so some of those are on the bottom of the screen. We work really well with the city of Charlottesville's economic development office, as well as our small business development center. They are, uh, the small business development center is co-located with a group called the Community Investment Collaborative, which is helping under-resourced entrepreneurs uh, last week, down at Woolen Mills, we did a big pitch, uh, the, the finalists of a pitch competition uh, gave presentations and $15,000 was awarded. Um, $10,000 was the first prize that went to a, a woman that has a, a, an apparel company that reuses clothes um, as a way to help the environment. And uh, the second place winner was a landscaping company, um, a minority owned, uh, landscaping company that's doing some really cool things. So the next slide uh, shows some of the, the pictures from that event. Um, that's just one of the ways that our office tries to support and partner with other organizations in the community. The next thing I wanted to talk about was um, some, some of the other major employers um, that we've worked with in the past, just to give uh, this audience some idea of the kinds of jobs that um, you may not know are in the community. In the top right-hand corner is a company called Castle Hill Gaming. They uh, produce the, um, the games that are played in a lot of uh, gambling and slot machines and, and that kind of space. They hire mathematicians, artists, designers, um, and put their product all over the world. Um, so as, as the, the gaming industry continues to innovate and grow, they're, um, they're innovating and their headquarters are located right here over in Stonefield. Um, Albemarle Business Campus is shown on the top left-hand part of the screen. Um, recently, they completed a building that looks just like a storage building, but comprised within that is a fertility company, another biotech company that's spurred out of the University of Virginia. Um, they had a governor's announcement too, where they committed to um, one and a half million dollars to building out their lab space there. They're creating 31 jobs. They're focused on um, male fertility and um, uh, they, they provide a proprietary type of analysis that um, also has the ability to change the world. Last company I wanna talk about is Afton Scientific. They're down on Avon Street. Um, they, uh, have also talked about their expansion plans and we partnered with the state to uh, grow the number of lab technicians that they have. Um, these are examples of, of primary businesses, once again, that um, provide the kind of career ladder jobs that uh, can buy a home in our community. So the next slide, uh, it, it talks about another partnership. Uh, we partnered with the United Way and made an announcement at TomTom Tom of a grant called the Envision Grant. This will provide up to $140,000 um, and $10,000 increments to area businesses um, that are minority owned. And uh, the United Way has the application on their website. It's um, applications are due May 26th. So I'd encourage anybody that knows someone that um, is trying to grow and scale their business um, that's minority owned to, to check this out. The next couple of slides, and then I'll, I'll get to questions. Um, this is talking about a grant that the uh, county received in partnership with the University of Virginia Foundation. Um, one of the things that Corey mentioned was, you know, tight inventory and um, 
you know, lack of available spaces. That happens in the industrial and commercial space too. And so we partnered with the University of Virginia Foundation to apply for a grant that could ready space within North Fork for a major business like the ones I've been talking about. Um, as we go out and meet with these businesses, they say, hey, I, I need a 40,000 square foot facility and um, you know, I need to have this number of parking spots and we're looking for this amount of acreage. And um, oftentimes we're saying, okay, well, you know, by the time we go through the approval process and the construction process and, you know, you get your financing in order, that's going to be, you know, two years down the line. And a company can't wait that long to expand. And so this grant um, allows the University of Virginia Foundation to um, prepare a pad site so that when a company comes and says, we want to grow right here, they can do that in, in a year to 18 months. So effectively cutting that time in about half. A um, couple other announcements I just wanted to plug was uh, today at the code building, there's a, um, the Small Business Development Center is putting on a presentation about growing international sales. We have a lot of, um, and that's, that information is on the next slide. Um, we have a lot of businesses that are growing their, their footprint bringing those financial resources back to our community by growing internationally. And so um, just to say something about our Small Business Development Center, they're award-winning. They are doing tremendous work. So if, um, if you or somebody you know could benefit from their services, I really encourage you to check out their, their website and see what they have to offer. And I'm gonna skip the next slide and go right to what I mentioned at the beginning um, this is a new tool that the county will be putting out around development. And I imagine it's a little difficult to see, but um, each of these dots on the screen represents a project that's either under review or approved. And so as realtors, you may get questions about, you know, what's, what's coming, what's in the pipeline, what's happening where. This is a, this is a, a GIS-based tool, a geographic tool. You could go to the specific parcel, click on it and get information. Is it a residential development? Is it a commercial development? What's the scope and scale? These are questions we get um, at the county often. So I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll sort of have this and we can empower the community to, to look at this information in real time as, as they need it. So um, I mentioned that I'm the interim uh, Director of Economic Development. On the next slide, you'll see um, this is this is our office right here. It's it's me and Ashley Hernandarena. Um, we are fortunate in our community to have uh, way too many opportunities than the two of us can handle. Um, that's why the partnerships that I talked about are so important. Um, but with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. And we has happened over the past 20 years is the county has effectively rotated away from that basically with your app um, you look at the absorption rate data and then by taking a lot of the LI time and rezoning it for commercial development which is all secondary Yeah, it's a, it's a great point and a great question. So um, the county adopted their first economic development strategic plan at the end of 2018, which for a community like ours is, is rather unusual. Many communities around Virginia have had economic development strategies for decades. And so um, this comprehensive plan update that's ongoing right now is the first one that will benefit from an economic development perspective. I would say that um, many of the decisions, the land use decisions that have been made in our community have not had any um, economic development input or really any consideration of how that impacts uh, the inventory of economic development space. So 
there's a study that is uh, that feeds into the comp plan process that looked at how much space we've lost over the last 20 years, and it's tremendous. Um, we used to have hundreds, if not thousands, of acres of of industrial space um, that has been rezoned for other purposes, and so um, the results of that study will help the Board of Supervisors determine um, really big questions for our community. Do we ever want to expand our development area? And if so, and if so how, how do we want to do it? Um, so those, those are tremendously big questions, uh, but we're finally at a point where we've quantified, uh, I think, some of the impact of that and can make, make an informed decision. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, ABC, I call it, Elmore Business Campus. So you mentioned about the, the fertility folks that are going to be in the biotech building there. Do you have a timeline for that? And do you know how many jobs they're bringing? Yeah, so the, the commitment was to create uh, 31 jobs over the next three years. And um, I believe that they're getting their lab space certified. After it's, after it's been constructed, they've, they've now got to go through a certification process for the type of analysis that they're doing. Um, I don't know exactly when that's going to open, but they are they are making progress. So it's actually inside the storage building? It is. So okay. that the Albemarle Business Campus is, is a pretty innovative design. And so included within that storage building was this 4,000 square feet. Um, you know, it could have been a pizza place. It could have been a restaurant, a, a, a other type, but um, this, this company said, you know, we, we want to be a, a, the first ones into this site as it develops. And they took um, a section that's right on the ground floor. It's, it's a five-story building, but um, from, the, from the outside, it only looks like it's about three. And they're right on the corner. So that's different from the, I call it like the, the northwest, northeast corner that's going to be a large potentially there's no identified person or company for that other parcel it's not a different parcel but you know what i mean not yet the bigger building yes uh so the the block that's um that she's referring to is um approved for up to 125,000 square foot um biotech manufacturing facility you all may have heard uh the university of virginia announced the 300 million dollar biotech institute and so our community is, is preparing for all of the follow-on investment that, that is anticipated from that. So um, that's an exciting, exciting block that uh, we would love to see come online as soon as possible. JT, I'm sure you felt the pressure of me coming closer and closer to you on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> we want to make sure we have enough time for our lockbox update. That's great information to provide for our clients and anybody thinking about starting a business, a commercial business in Elmore County. So uh, CARS Foundation, we're going to get a quick update as well from that. The CAR Foundation, which is a uh, 501c3, is intended to be an effective mechanism for realtors to donate their time, talent, resources, and impact sustain and support community engagement and initiatives. While our foundation is still in its infantry, infancy, <laughs> it's not going out and fighting, infancy, <laughs> the foundation board of directors have had, have been working hard to get things off the ground. I would like to invite Tammy, where's Tammy at? Tammy Wilt, Tammy, we got a rush through this a little bit, okay? Keep us on track because we got to get on that bus. Um, something coming a little bit later on today. So um, I'm going to introduce you and you're going to provide us with a nice update. You and Greg. Greg in here too? All righty. Come on up.
Good morning. We'll try to make this fairly quickly and painless. Um, thank you, as Lisa. The Carr Foundation received its first official IRS letter in October of 2021. And in December of 2021, it received its first donation from Carr of $71,000. On behalf of the Carr Foundation and its board of directors, we have been working hard to get this new organization up and running. Near the end of last year, our board worked with the Spark Mill, which is a consulting firm based in Richmond to capture members' insight and feedback through a survey that hopefully most of you filled out. The survey was an opportunity for members to weigh in on what they are passionate about and what would interest them as the Car Foundation works to leverage the collective power of its members' generosity. Using the results of the survey, the Foundation Board of Directors created a draft strategic plan. Uh, we want to focus on five goals that we'd like to share here. Um, advance the creation of affordable homes in Charlottesville. Equip residents of the greater Charlottesville area for affordable housing and home ownership through education and resources. And advocate the benefits of affordable housing and home ownership within the greater Charlottesville area. And our last two goals are to resource, resource, equip, and engage car members to support the greater Charlottesville community in finding and obtaining um, affordable housing and home ownership, develop an infrastructure to support strategic goals. And our final strategic plan has just been approved, so we will be sharing it with the entire membership soon. We are also currently working on the business plan, which includes hiring a dedicated staff person. Please know we are not trying to duplicate the efforts of other like-minded nonprofits or community organizations. Instead, we are trying to build alliances and strategic partnerships where we can help excel their current housing projects or provide influence from the realtor perspective. As you heard a moment ago, the first contribution from the board to the foundation was $71,000. We've just received uh, another contribution from the board for an additional $71,000. And to help you understand where that money comes from, some of you may recall in the mid 2000s, we raised money to create a down payment assistance fund to help people become homeowners in the space. Those were loans that were repayable at the time these homes were transferred. And so as those funds come back to CAR, CAR has uh, directed those funds to be under the CAR Foundation's purview because those are uh, resources that were created for affordable housing originally, and we'll repurpose those funds and put them to work again. So we're not here formally ready to ask for contributions, financial contributions at this time, but I'll say there's two ways you can engage the foundation. If... <laughs> there's two ways you can engage with the foundation now. We'll accept your donations happily, right? We have, we're a working board. We haven't got to the point where we're ready to hire an executive director or, or any staff at all. Uh, MK is on the board. She's here. Jessica Russo is on the board. She's here. You can reach out to any of us. And of course, we would accept your financial contributions if you want to make uh, contributions in the affordable housing space. And we think we're a good place to house that, those, those funds. But the other thing is, and it happened this morning, I had a conversation with Mary Newton. Mary Newton actually served with a, a, a nonprofit of which I'd never heard of that's in the housing space. And, and we need to know more about the organizations in the community that are in these spaces. We're, we're all aware of the big ones, but our goal is to be kind of a hub of, of figuring out who's doing what in the space and how we put our resources behind those organizations, create collaborations or whatever we can do to do as much as possible with our resources. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy and Greg, Chair and Vice Chair, for doing that in such a timely manner. Greatly appreciate that. Um, I know that the Carr Foundation is going to do great things. We're looking forward to seeing what comes out of that. Um, very excited about that. At this time, I would like to ask Ann Oliver, the MLS Rules and Regulations Committee Chair, to join me on the stage. Come on, Ann. I'm not going to bite you. Come on. <laughs> she said thank you. <laughs> I know um, many of you are patiently waiting for more details about our conversion, right? Our Century Lock conversion and the exchange and information. So Anne is going to give us some information. Thank you. Thank you, um, Lisa. 
Um, hello, everyone. Um, please note that all of the information being shared now will also be emailed to you uh, via membership on Monday, May 22nd, and that will be followed by secondary messages until um, it's time for the lockbox exchange. Um, the lockbox exchange from Supra to Century Lock will occur on Tuesday, July 18th through Wednesday, July 19th. And we do have a makeup date. Just in case you're not available, it'll be the next week. Okay. And I think also we mentioned that if you can't bring your lock boxes in yourself, you can actually ask someone else to bring them in for you. Uh, agents will need to bring your super lock boxes and complete mandatory training. You have to do the training before you can begin using the lock boxes to receive pre um, to receive their pre-programmed sentry lock lock boxes. From start to finish, agents will need to dedicate one and a half hours um, for training and the exchange. And you and your brokerage will be pre-assigned a specific date and time for training and exchange. Okay. So you're gonna okay. All right. Car staff will automatically register you for the specific um, pre-assigned pre-assigned dates and times. So don't worry about that. They will inform you. Um, you will receive your mandatory train mandatory training confirmation email by the end of the day on Friday, May the twenty sixth. Anything with a twenty sixth is a great number. That's when my birthday is. <laughs> It's June the 26th, just saying, okay? <laughs> Write that down. In addition to, in addition to uh, the confirmation email, you will receive additional email reminders for you to show up. It's gonna be important. To ensure we have plenty of inside space and enough parking to accommodate the thousand plus realtors, Members and training and lockbox exchange will take place at the Point Church. That's a totally different location where you're probably thinking it was going to be here. So be mindful and come show up in the right place. It's conven conveniently located on Pantops behind the giant shopping center. Okay. See the staff if you need additional directions. They weren't expecting that. We will provide instructions on what you do, what you can do and not do when you come for the pre-assigned dates and times, your registration and confirmation email and reminder emails. We'll, we'll cover all that, making sure that you are reminded and that you get it. And it's gonna go by firm. So if you cannot attend, as Ann just said, we will provide you with a possible makeup date and time for early August. Okay. If you are unable to attend, as Ann said, I feel like I'm repeating what Ann said. <laughs> That's okay. You are um, you can be reassigned a date and time to um, designate or a colleague. Get somebody basically get somebody to come and pick it up for you to exchange your lock boxes. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, so even if you don't have a super lock box, you still have to. Um participate in the mandatory training because um, the training help you open the center lock, lock boxes. It will also help you assign one day codes to ensure equal access to all realtors in our ever expanding geography and more. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me start over. Okay, so even if you don't have a super lock box, you'll still have to complete the mandatory training. Um, training helps um, you open the Century Lock lockbox, assign one day codes to ensure equal access to all realtors in an ever expanding geography and more. And agents with super lock boxes will receive an inventory list from car staff in the day on Friday, May 26th. And you will have until June 12th to check your lock box, super lock boxes with inventory list that we provided you. And uh, if you see any discrepancies in your lock boxes and the inventory list we provided, you will need to complete a Supra transfer or lost lockbox form and return it to us so we can update you and the system. Y'all get all that? Okay. <laughs> You're going to be reminded multiple times. Um, <laughs> 
So don't worry about that. Um, the entire membership will be emailed on May the 22nd, followed by a secondary message until it's time for the lockbox exchange. So just reinforcing, they're gonna make sure that you are well informed. And I'm going to speed this up a little bit because we are very conscious of time. Um, and just as a reminder, use the lockbox conversion icon on the single sign-on dashboard to refer to any information that has been disseminated on the lockbox exchange. And there's the arrow, that little house there, where you can go for additional information and or use the QR code that's also available. So this PowerPoint presentation is available now on the webpage until the full details and emails go out on Monday. So it's coming, it's coming real quick. All righty. And thank you for sharing with me all this information. Thank you so much. We appreciate all your hard work and making sure that we get the information and everything, everybody stays up to date. All right. I see you coming to me. <laughs> but before we, before we wrap up, <laughs> before we wrap up, I do want to invite um, American Red Cross account manager of the Earliesville district, Alexis Ennis to come up and share some information about our recent blood drive. Come on up. Thank you, everybody. I promise I will be brief. I know this is your favorite portion where we talk about blood. <laughs> don't worry, I did not bring my fangs. That happened on Tuesday and I don't see a whole lot of y'all's faces over here. So I hope you all had an opportunity to come and donate blood with us. We do sponsor two blood drives. Um, we just had our first one. We collected 23 life-saving pints. Thank you very much. Everybody give yourselves a round of applause. Our next blood drive will be on August 1st. Our mission is to collect 27 pints. So I hope that you're inspired by what I talk about today and you will sign up with me or online and, and come and donate some blood. I just want to, in the spirit of DEI, I just wanted to share with you guys um, uh, our sickle cell mission. Um, a lot of people have heard about sickle cell disease, but they don't really know a lot about sickle cell disease. And I just want to let y'all know that everybody has the power to save lives within them. Blood, there is power in the blood. I don't know if you go to church, but I'm sure you've heard that before. And I'm going to share with you why that is. So um, sickle cell disease in the, in the United States mostly affects African Americans. Um, they, uh, it is very painful disease. It's something that you're born with. It's genetic um, that, you, that you get at birth. Um, in, the, in the state of Virginia, since the uh, early 2000s, every baby that's born in the state of Virginia is tested. So they're identified early and we're able to get treatment for them. I don't know if you know, but here at UVA Medical Center, we do have a sickle cell uh, pediatric department specifically to help those patients that are over here in the west western part of the state. So we are partnering with um, the sickle cell department at UVA this September, which is Sickle Cell Awareness Month, and we're going to host our blood drive a little bit earlier than that to give everybody an opportunity to come out and save lives. Um, the power that you have in your blood um, comes from uh, the different proteins and things that you have on your blood uh, cell. Most people are familiar or can be familiar with their blood type. If you have had a baby, I have had four. Um, they will test you and they will let you know what you are and what your babies are because that depends on your ability to get what they call Rogam after you have babies. If you are um, a negative, so if you're O negative, B negative, A negative, and you have your baby, they will often give you Rogam if your child is a different blood type than you are. So just to kind of give you guys a little bit of blood stuff, um, when you donate blood, it is very life-saving. And uh, if you have your blood type, I'm O positive. I'm actually a sickle cell donor myself. So I'll just give you the example of why I donate blood. Um, I'm O positive. I am CEK negative, which means that I am the gold standard for a patient with sickle cell disease. When a patient who um, has a disease like sickle cell comes to get blood transfusions, they often do so to help alleviate the pain and suffering that they're going through. Uh, most of the time, the only way to treat someone who is going through a pain crisis is with a blood transfusion and making sure that, the, that those products are closely matched, especially in the case of sickle cell, 
where a patient may require up to 100 pints of blood a year to treat their symptoms may be required. Every person, every transfusion that you get, you're introduced to a different person, a different person's antibodies, and you can, or I'm sorry, antigens, and you can create antibodies to those. So it becomes harder and harder and harder to find matched blood products for those patients. So that's why we constantly need a new supply. Blood is kind of like milk. It has an expiration date. It doesn't last forever. It has to be stored under particular conditions. So we call you all the time, ask you to come and give, and um, to make sure that we have those products available on the shelf when it's needed. Um, that was a specific example. I'm sure that there's other folks who have known somebody who's ever needed blood. If you've ever um, had anybody that's been in a traumatic car accident, moms and babies frequently have um, complications during childbirth that require blood transfusions. And as we're getting ready to get into the summer months, people travel all the time. And uh, on the highways, there's always traumatic car accidents. There's always a need for blood. Um, the need does not take a break during the summer, does not take a vacation, unfortunately. We require in our region 350 pints every single day to make sure that we meet the need for our hospital patients. So um, of the eligible population, only 3% actually give. So this is just my reminder that um, if you have the ability to do so, um, if you are uh, 16 years with your parents' permission or older, I think that applies to everybody in this room, if you are at least 110 pounds, no offense, that's everybody in this room. And if you are in general good health, which means that you feel well and healthy, again, I believe that's everybody in this room because if you didn't feel well and healthy, I don't think you would be here today. Um, you are eligible to give blood. So just please consider joining us on August 1st at our blood drive. Um, we'll give you some juice and cookies. Maybe we'll give you a special little prize um, <laughs> of the, uh, May, Memorial Day, sorry, thank you. Uh, Memorial Day, we're giving out beach blankets uh, for folks that come and donate blood with us. So we have lots of fun giveaways all summer long as a special thank you for coming in during your summer vacation to make sure that we have that blood available on the shelf. So thank you very much for your time. Ooh, that was a lot. Thank you so much. I always feel like I'm rushing you off the stage. I really am. <laughs> Thank you, Alexis. Our next um, blood drive, as she mentioned, will be Tuesday, August the 1st from 10 to 4 here at the Hillsdale Center. If you can donate, we encourage you to do so and make an appointment. Um, as we close, I want to congratulate Kim Armstrong, who's sitting in the front, and uh, Quentin Beckham for completing the Broker Premier Program with the Virginia Realtors. Congratulations to you both. In addition, I would like to recognize Mallory Naper for completing the Property Management uh, cert certif Certification Program with Virginia Realtors. She in here? Nope, nope, all right. I would like to welcome the following new realtors. They're on the screen. In addition, are they on there? Okay. <laughs> In addition, our new affiliates. Ta-da. All right, now, this might be good news for some people. We will take a general membership hiatus for, from late spring through summer. Y'all not applauding for that? <laughs> so I look forward to seeing you at our annual Development and Economic Summit on Thursday, September the 7th from 2 to 5 p.m. here at the Hillsdale Center. We have great lineup speakers, including um, a panel discussion between Lawrence Yoon, who is our chief economist at the National Association of Realtors, and Danuska Naniska. Shellington, and she is the forecasting and analysis of NAR of home builders, excuse me, not NAR, the National Association of Home Builders. And the moderator will be our famous Ryan Price, our chief economist of Virginia Realtors. We will also receive um, Nelson County economist updates with the econ uh, economic director, Maureen Kelly. Registration, of course, is free and it's going to be um, at, on car education calendar. 
if you are planning to carpool, who's getting on that bus this after in a few minutes? Save me a seat. We're going to um, Williamsburg for NAR, riding with the brand immediately after this meeting. It's free. I think we might even still have some seats available if you can tag along with us. I hope that you all have a great day. It's been an exciting meeting. Yes, I'm rushing through it. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Thank you all.